Hi everybody, it's a great pleasure to be here to talk to you today about walking. Um, and uh, what I want to do is, is uh, pick this uh, mundane activity and show you that there is a, actually an elaborate uh, new science behind it, which we've come to understand over the, uh, the last uh, number of years. So I'm going to start with a quote and uh, an image that you may recognize. At, at the bottom, you have John Cleese from the Ministry of, of uh, Silly Walks. And above is a, uh, an old quote from the British anthropologist, uh, John Napier. Um, he says, human walking is a unique activity during which the body step by step teeters on the edge of catastrophe. Now, if you had paid attention to uh, Cleese as he was walking, you would have noticed that uh, he uh, moved around. Uh, he threw his legs up in all sorts of interesting positions. And he also did something social. He nodded to somebody as, and caught their eyes as they were walking past him. Um, this tells us something very interesting, that actually, although you can conceive of walking as being on the edge of catastrophe, the reality is that uh, we most of the time are able to get around in the world and we do something social when we're walking. So this is a theme I'm going to come back to a couple of times over the, the course of the talk. Now, let's just uh, go back uh, a little in history and think about how walking first evolved. Uh, we humans are uh, land dwellers, our bias is towards uh, the land, and it seems very natural for us to think that walking first evolved on land. But the reality is that that's not correct, and uh, we can show that uh, from recent genetic studies. Uh, and there's a, a way of doing this that allows you to test where walking might have evolved by examining uh, the genetic programs that control walking in differing species. Now, the starting point here, of course, is uh, are there species in the sea who walk along the ocean floor? And of course, there are many crabs walk along the ocean floor. Here are two uh, particularly beautiful examples, the rosy-lipped batfish, uh, which walks on the floor using its pectoral fin, or my favourite here, the nearly transparent uh, sea pig, uh, which uh, scavenges and walks very, very ably along the ocean floor. So walking actually does occur in the ocean. Uh, we shouldn't think that just because there are fish uh, swimming that uh, there are no other, no other forms of propulsion or locomotion. Of course there are. And uh, here's an example of, of how we can address this question. On the left here, you have the skate. Um, this is a, a flat fish that lives along the, ocean, uh, along the, the bottom of the ocean on the ocean floor and it pushes itself along the, the ocean floor with uh, these kind of hind limbs. And on the right, we have mice, uh, a land-dwelling, warm-blooded animal with four limbs. Um, now, these are very uh, uh, different species. One is warm-blooded, one is cold-blooded, one lives in the water, one lives on land. Um, but they have some commonalities. They both have a spinal cord uh, and they have hips. Uh, and they have uh, legs that extend and push against the substrate uh, to allow them to move around in, in the world. So the question then is, uh, is the gene complex that controls the development of the motor neurons, uh, the muscles and all of the other things uh, that are required for walking similar or different to each other in the skate and the tetrapod, the four-limbed animal, uh, the mouse? Um, a variety of methods can show that the last common ancestor of these two species lived at around about 400 or 420 million years ago. Um, but do the genetic programs that uh, control uh, limb excursion and uh, movement in these animals differ or are they the same? And the remarkable answer that we get from genetics is that they are indeed the same. Uh, the tetrapod has a, a doubling of them, but you'll see on the right, you've got the HOX67 uh, and the HOX10 gene with an insertion to give you the extra uh, walking that occurs, or the, the extra control of movement that occurs in the, uh, in the mouse. So this is really quite remarkable. Uh, contrary to what you might think, Genetic studies show that the program for walking evolved in the sea at least 420 million years ago and probably a little bit further back in time than that. This is a, a great example of the uh, profound 
importance of modern technology for allowing you to answer questions which fossil technology or fossil exploration couldn't possibly allow you to answer because the tissues uh, involved uh, are lost uh, to the sands of time. Now, Ireland has a small part to play in this story. Um, the first land walking animals are known as tetrapods. And uh, there are a few sites in the world, not many, perhaps four, perhaps five, uh, where there are tetrapod trackways. And uh, here's an example of, or here is the tetrapod trackway uh, in Ireland. It's uh, on Valencia Island, uh, down in the southeast, or sorry, southwest in uh, Kerry. Uh, here's a picture uh, of the tetrapod trackway. This was found by accident uh, on a farmer's land by a Swiss PhD student named Irvin Stossel, um, who uh, realized when he was looking at it that this, in fact, was a, a fossil uh, trackway. This is really uh, a spectacular site and is well worth going to visit uh, if you ever uh, get the opportunity. Here's a, a picture that gives you a, a different view of the uh, uh, tetrapod trackway. It's estimated that the animal was perhaps a metre and a half for so long uh, and that it walked with an undulating gait. Uh, its fore paws and hind paws are visibly imprinted. This is suspected to have been a, a dried out uh, riverbed. And uh, this kind of fossil evidence is known as trace fossil evidence because uh, there's no trace of, of, of the bones of the animal. There's just the trace of the behavior the animal engaged in, namely the walking across uh, this surface. Um, it's sometimes thought that Ireland doesn't have much by way of, of uh, fossil evidence. I think this is uh, because we haven't looked very hard. And here's a, a story from the Irish Times uh, a year or two ago showing that an amphibian, you can see the picture on the bottom left, a four-limbed creature, uh, cold-blooded, uh, the bones of this fossilized creature were discovered in uh, Clare uh, quite recently. And it's probably the case that uh, there are many more such bones awaiting discovery if we were to conduct uh, a national survey in the appropriate locations. But the key point, of course, here is that the tetrapod to the south walked on land. And here we have one 100 million years later also walking on land, but we actually have the bones of uh, this animal uh, to study. Now, let's just think about the journey from evolution to development, evo-devo as it's sometimes uh, referred to. How do you get up on your own two feet? Uh, this is a, a question that has not been very well studied over the past 100 years or so. Surprisingly, the textbooks of neurology will typically present um, stages that the animal, or sorry, the, the, the child is expected to pass through, but the transition from a stable uh, position, crawling on four limbs, uh, to uh, an upright, somewhat tottering position on two limbs uh, is a really remarkable one, and humans are unique in making that transition. So how do you do it? Well, this beautiful paper by Karen Adolf and her colleagues, published a number of years ago, summarizes how you do it in the title very effectively. You learn to walk by making thousands of steps and having dozens of falls per day. So what they do is they take children uh, to a walking laboratory, which has lots of, of uh, uh, items for them to walk and crawl on. They have a gate mat here up on the, the top right, and they track the position of the child as it moves around in the world. And uh, they code the changes in the child's behavior as it transitions from crawling on four limbs to walking. And uh, they show some really, really remarkable findings. First of all, uh, the average 12 to 19 month year old, uh, or month old child averages an astonishing two and a half thousand steps per hour. And they fall, contrary to uh, Napier's assertion, without disaster, about 17 times per hour. Now, of course, the number of falls uh, goes down over time and uh, the, the numbers of successfully executed steps uh, arise, uh, rises through time. So this is a really remarkable finding because it shows a couple of things. First of all, it shows that children engage in uh, unsuspectedly large amounts of, of uh, practice in order to learn how to walk. 
Uh, they do this over a long period of time and they do not need to be exposed to a walking community in order to learn to walk. They just need the space within which to do so. This is different to language where we humans need to be exposed to a language community during the critical uh, early years of life uh, between about birth and about seven or eight years of age in order to learn how to speak grammatically and become part of a language community. We don't need to do this uh, where walking is concerned. What we just need is the space within which uh, to move. Now, how much do you walk? Uh, the child uh, makes, as we said, about 2,300, 2,400 steps per hour. Uh, adults though, what happens in adults? Well, what we now know from smartphone data is that adults don't walk very much um, and that there are quite marked variations in the amount of walking that we do depending on the country uh, that you live in. Uh, but in the average high income country, adults walk somewhere around about four and a half thousand steps a day on average, uh, with the Japanese walking at around about five and a half thousand steps a day, the UK and the USA a little bit less than that, maybe perhaps four and a half thousand steps a day, and uh, Saudi Arabia uh, walking the least. Um, and it would be possible to think that the reason that Saudi Arabians walk the least is to do with heat. It doesn't, because there are migratory tribes in uh, this, this region and have been uh, for many thousands of years. The reason appears to be to do with the walking infrastructure uh, in the towns and cities. And we can test a thought like this quite easily by looking at the built environment and look at how the built environment affects the amount of walking that people engage in. Uh, so there is an index known as the walkability index uh, for cities in the United States. And uh, high walkable cities are cities like New York or Boston, where uh, you can get around on foot very easily. Uh, and low walkable cities are cities like Arlington or Memphis where, or Houston, where you really need a car. And what you see uh, from the smartphone data is very straightforward, that there is a morning peak, a midday peak and an evening peak in walking, uh, which is not there for the low walkability cities. And this uh, peak is also preserved at the weekend. People walk a lot at the weekend in very walkable cities compared to uh, cities that are of low walkability. Now, it's often said that a, a good treatment or a good thing to do if you're feeling depressed or in a bad mood is, is to go for a walk, uh, that it can actually be good for you psychologically. Um, and uh, one of the contentions uh, that I make uh, in my book, but it's not an unreasonable one at all, is that generally physical activity uh, acts as a kind of a prophylactic against major uh, depressive disorder. And we have very good evidence that this might be so now. So I'm going to talk you through two different studies just to illustrate these two points. One is a small scale study of college students and the other is a large scale epidemiological study which uh, uh, is, uh, whose finding, or the findings of which is uh, representative of uh, what has been found more generally. So in this study by uh, Miller and uh, Krizan, what they do is bring students to uh, the uh, test room and they give them one of two different tasks. One is to sit at a table and judge the beauty of buildings around the Iowa State University and also fill in a questionnaire about how they're currently feeling. And the other is to make them walk around the campus and judge the beauty of those buildings in person. And uh, the question then is, does incidental walking make you feel better? And the answer they find is yes. Walking, uh, even though it's incidental to the main task, gives a boost in self-reported uh, positive feelings, uh, which is quite considerable compared to people who are seated. And it does not cause any change in self-reported negative feelings. And uh, in a clever little twist, one of the things they did in this study was to ask people how much they enjoyed walking. Um, and some people love walking, I'm one of them, uh, but there are some people who hate walking, so they call this the dread walking condition. And even in people who dislike walking, um, they get an increase in positive feelings 
as a result of getting out there and actually engaging in a walk. Now, the uh, positive change in emotion induced by what is in effect a short walk might be uh, a short-term effect of no particular interest. But we know that uh, uh, health promotion agencies right across the world are focused on this issue of getting people to move. So what I want to do is just focus on this very large scale uh, study from Australia. There are many, many studies like this uh, being published now, but this is a particularly nice one because the sample size is enormous and it's a prospective study. In other words, they're following people through time. So what they do is take a group of about 34,000 adults and they follow them for 11 years and they measure exercise, depression, anxiety, and other things. And these are a healthy cohort. So they have no mental disorders. And the question then is what happens uh, to major depressive disorder in this population, depending on the level of activity, the level of, of movement that the people engage in. And what they find is very remarkable that about 12% of future cases of depression could be prevented if all participants had engaged in at least one hour of physical activity per week. So this is much lower than the uh, uh, healthy heart guidelines. Uh, and I'm not suggesting that you should walk less than the healthy heart guidelines or be physically less active than it. But the treatment, as it were here, to get people to walk uh, for about an hour, uh, once a week, perhaps 20 minutes a day, a couple of times a week, uh, has marked effects on protecting against the onset of depression. And the conclusion is straightforward. Regular leisure time exercise of any intensity provides protection against future depression. Now, in this study, they didn't find an effect on anxiety. Other studies seem to have found also an effect on anxiety. So uh, I think there is, we need more data to try and understand why that might have been the case. But the key point here is that the promotion of regular physical activity in people who are not especially active has a marked effect at preventing those people, or at least reducing the likelihood of those people succumbing to major depressive disorder in the future. Uh, a really quite profound and uh, quite important uh, effect uh, where physical activity is concerned. Now, it's, writers and others of the ages have suggested uh, that walking uh, can actually boost creativity. And there's lots of anecdotal evidence to suggest, for example, that uh, great writers uh, like to go for a walk before uh, they engage in writing. Uh, we have a a, a wonderful local example, uh, Sir William Rowan Hamilton, uh, the inventor of uh, quaternions and uh, uh, the Hamiltonian in mathematics. Um, and one of the things that's really interesting about uh, Hamilton is that he was a great walker. He used to walk from Dunsink in North Dublin to Trinity and also to the Royal Irish Academy, pondering the quaternion uh, equation. And finally, one day he discovered the equation and had no pen, but did have his tobacco knife. So cut the equation into uh, a brick on uh, Broombridge um, uh, in North Dublin so that he would not forget the, uh, the equation. And he describes it thus, a, a really remarkable uh, quotation, I think. Here there dawned on me the notion that we must admit, in some sense, a fourth dimension of space for the purpose of calculating with triples. An electric circuit seemed to close and a spark flashed forth. I think that beautifully captures the uh, whole sense of, of the aha moment where creativity is concerned. Now, was the walking a key part of his creative thinking or was it incidental to it? <clears throat> we can test this, and this is something that has only been done recently. And there are a variety of ways of doing it. One way of doing it uh, is to bring people to the laboratory and ask them to do something very simple, very straightforward, which is to uh, 
engage in some walking and then to do a creative problem solving task. One such task is the alternative uses task where you're handed a variety of common household objects. And your job is to come up with as many uses for those objects as you can in a defined period of time. So how many uses can you think of for a can of beans? How many can uses can you think of for a paper clip? Things like this. And what you find is that there's a modest correlation between IQ and performance on this task and a very substantial uh, correlation between performance on this task and working in a creative occupation. So Opezzo, Marley Opezzo and Daniel Schwartz at, Dan at Stanford University have tested this idea. And what they've done is get people to walk for short periods of time before engaging in, in the divergent uses task and comparing their performance on the convergent task where the, there's only a single unique solution. And what they find is that walking has no effect on your performance where a single unique solution is, is sought, but where the task is open-ended and you must think in creative ways uh, to generate alternative uses, um, people's creative idea production approximately doubles. Uh, this also works on a treadmill when they compare people being seated on a chair on a treadmill to walking uh, on the treadmill. And it also works for the generation of analogies. And interestingly, although I won't deal with it here, um, this effect also appears in uh, people who are elderly. So if you take an older population, people in their late 60s or early 70s, <coughs> excuse me, and you compare their performance to seated uh, adults in their, in their late teens or early 20s, what you find is that the uh, uh, older adults perform at about twice the level of the seated uh, young uh, adults. So walking is the key thing, getting up and moving through the world. Which brings me to the question of how it is that we do move through the world, how we navigate the world. Um, it's natural to think that we do this uh, because uh, we have astonishingly good visual abilities and we do as humans. Um, but does our movement in the world, our ability to get to somewhere depend on our vision or is there something else going on? Now, I'm sure most of you have had the experience of, of uh, being in a room when the lights have gone out, when it's gone dark, and you've had to navigate your way from your seat to the, uh, uh, to the door. Uh, and not a trivial task, actually, if you want to do it without accident. So one way of addressing this question is to take people who are blind from birth, people who've become blind later in life and compare their performance on a triangle completion task to people who have normal vision, but who are wearing blindfolds. And what you do is, is you ask these individuals to walk at a starting point, make a body turn, go to an end point, and then go back to the start point again. Uh, so they, they walk in effect three limbs of uh, a triangle. And then you compare their performance, um, depending on whether they normally sighted but blindfolded, blind uh, as a result of an accident during the course of life, or uh, blind from birth. And what you find is something really quite remarkable. Uh, there's very little difference in performance between people who are blind, uh, people who are normally sighted, um, and people who become blind during the course of life. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, this study by Loomis and his colleagues has been uh, replicated many times. And what they find is that there are very small performance differences across groups, um, and they were not consistent across tasks. And the key point is that their results provide little indication that spatial competence depends strongly on prior visual experience. This must be because vision does not predominate how we understand the world or how we get around in the world. Actually, vision contributes to how we get around in the world, but we have other senses that do this as well. And in one of the most remarkable discoveries uh, about brain function over the past, I think, 50 or 80 years, uh, it is now apparent that the brain has a GPS system, which allows us to create maps of the world. Um, the studies that show this 
uh, derived from uh, Edward Tolman in the late 1940s, who using this uh, uh, special sunburst maze found, I would ask an animal to run in uh, at point A, exit the tunnel at point B, run to the tunnel at point C, make a left turn, make a right turn, make a right turn, and then retrieve food. And then he would cheat. He would close off a path that they would ordinarily have used and ask them to uh, uh, try and find the food using the sunburst maze. And if the animal is using something like a survey map of the environment, what it would do is go to point B. If it's relying on previous motor movements, it would head for the uh, the blocked off tunnel and try to navigate from there. And what he found was that rats are very, very good at doing this. They go to the point uh, where they were previously fed and they do so with great ease. Um, and this led John O'Keefe, among others, uh, but O'Keefe uh, pioneered this work, uh, to think about how it is that uh, we, anim we humans and uh, animals like rats represent information about the world. And he discovered in uh, a, a justly celebrated and famous uh, paper in the, published in the early 1970s, that in a part of the brain known as the hippocampus, uh, there are cells which fire according to where you are in space, in what looks like approximately Cartesian coordinates, um, rather than what you're doing in that particular place in space. And O'Keefe was to go on and win the Nobel Prize in Physiology uh, or Medicine for this discovery in uh, 2014, along with Maybrit Moser and Edvard Moser, who discovered another type of cell, uh, the so-called grid cells, which provide a metric uh, for space. So uh, place cells tell you where you are, uh, grid cells tell you approximately how much you have moved uh, in space. There's another category of cell known as the head direction cell, which tells you uh, where you are going. So you have a compass, uh, you have position, and you have movement information uh, all in the brain. In other words, the rudiments that would be required uh, for cognitive mapping. Now, what I want to do is, is think a little bit about policy uh, for a moment on walking. Most of the world now lives in urban areas, uh, with Brazil possibly being the most urbanized uh, country on the planet. And this means, by definition, most of our walking would be urban. It would be in towns and cities. Um, our streets used to be terrible for walkers. Um, this is a, a famous poem from London in the early 1700s, uh, describing how chamber pots would be emptied on the heads of walkers. And uh, many of the Georgian buildings in this country and in, in other countries have these boot scrapers at the door uh, so that people could remove the uh, uh, unpleasantness from the soles of their shoes. And uh, public health, of course, uh, changes, uh, engineered these problems out of our buildings. Uh, but we need to still think about public health, not for uh, the issue of human waste handling, but human mental health and human uh, physical health. Our streets are still quite terrible for walkers. So I, I want to really approach this from two points of view. The first is from the point of view of aging. Everywhere we look, humans are living longer. Um, but we have constructed a society where people who are older find it difficult to cross the road in time. Uh, this important study by Laura Asher and her colleagues of about 3,000 adults in the UK showed that about 85% of males and 95% of females had a walking impairment. Uh, they were unable to cross the road at the time that road crossing or uh, road traffic lights are set uh, for walkers at the relevant speed because they walk below this speed. In other words, walking the city for the elderly is a particular problem because they may have a walking impairment and we have designed the city around the needs of young adults who are mobile rather than around the needs of uh, people with mobility impairments arising from frailty from aging, perhaps arising from visual restriction or arising from other problems uh, resulting in them having to use walkers or uh, wheelchairs. Uh, this is Galway, uh, my hometown, and uh, this is a, a, a view 
uh, towards the cathedral. And on the western edge of Galway, you have a junction which has recently been installed, which is quite remarkable. Uh, it takes uh, 14 minutes for an able-bodied person to get from one side of the road to the other because the needs of walkers have been uh, placed secondary to the needs of the movement of cars and the local authority has not bothered to put in even uh, a simple walkway. So if you're living on the right-hand side of the road and you want to get to the shops on the left and you have a mobility impairment, uh, a considerable imposition on your dignity uh, of life and quality of life has been imposed uh, as a result of this road traffic design. Pedestrians, as I've just suggested, are too often ignored in favour of motorists. Uh, if we think about Dublin, where do tourists like to go? Where do people like to congregate and amble about? People do not come to Ireland, come to Dublin to view the M50 motorway and the traffic jam that is on the motorway. Uh, this is the top 15 uh, attractions in Dublin. You will note that these attractions are all places that people gather and walk together. They are not car oriented destination. Uh, Pedestrianisation uh, really makes a substantial difference to how people view a city and where people gather in that city. Uh, this is a picture of Taormina in Italy. Uh, this is one of the uh, great Italian traditions, one which, uh, uh, of course, is facilitated by the uh, wonderful weather they have in Italy, the, the so-called Passeggiata. And uh, this is uh, the, one of the squares in Taormina. And uh, you can see everybody is gathering, walking around in, in the evening, talking at ease with each other. And they can do so because the car is excluded from this public space to facilitate uh, the movement of individuals. Uh, I suggest we should adopt the acronym EASE where public planning of our towns and cities are concerned. Our towns and cities should be easy to walk. They should be accessible to all, and I underline all. That means people with mobility impairments. That means people with visual restrictions. It means every uh, individuals should have easy access to our cities and towns. They should be safe for people to walk around and they should be enjoyable uh, for all. Uh, this will pay us back in all sorts of ways, in terms of social capital, in terms of the prevention of, of uh, future episodes of major depressive disorder, and in terms of physical health as well. Uh, Paris is undergoing this transformation at the moment, the so-called 15-minute city, um, where everything will be within a 15-minute walk of your front door. And uh, this brings, I think, itself to another natural question. Why are we thinking about moving away from the motor car at all? It's a 100-year-long experiment and one that has brought many benefits, but one that has brought also uh, a great many difficulties. And what I want to do is, is kind of shift gear a little and think about the issue of locomotion. Um, and I've probably given away a slight hint of uh, the clue uh, or to the, the answer that I want to give here. Uh, why do we have a brain? Or let's put it a different way. What problem does having a brain solve for you? So let's look at a, a very different creature. This is a, 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 a tunicate, uh, also known as a sea squirt. And when you look at it, this is in its larval stage. It has a spinal cord. It's a really a small, uh, it's a small, but a really quite remarkable little creature. The possession of this spinal cord puts it in the same animal, part of the animal kingdom uh, as we humans. Uh, it swims, uh, it eats, it, it attempts to avoid being eaten. It can tell up from down and uh, it has a heart, it has a brain. Uh, it has a stomach, it has a digestive system. But this animal undergoes a remarkable transformation during the course of its life. As it transitions from being a larva to being uh, an adult, it sticks itself uh, to a rock and it undergoes a, a really quite remarkable change uh, in its morphology. Um, and one of the remarkable things it does is that it ingests its own nervous system. Uh, it no longer needs to solve the problem of movement, so it therefore no longer needs uh, a brain in order to get around 
in the world. Uh, so it's brain cells or it's, it's proto brain are now used as a needle. Now, what happens in humans who are mobility restricted? Well, frailty is a, a considerable problem uh, in people who spend long periods of time in hospital. And here's a, a, a lovely study from a couple of years ago in healthy young males in their late 20s and, and early 30s who are confined to an envelope-shaped uh, waterbed for three days. Uh, their muscle strength is measured. Uh, scans are taken of their, of, uh, their uh, legs and changes are then tested over this period. And what you find from being placed in this condition just for three days is a decrease in muscle volume, a decrease in muscle strength, and a decrease in what's called the viscoelasticity of the muscle. So this is the ability of the muscle to resume or go back to the position that it had been in previously when it's been distorted in some way. If you squeeze a, a rubber block, you'll see that it, it re reassumes the shape that it had previously. So this is the measure of uh, viscoelasticity. The conclusion is, is, I think, a little worrying. Three days of muscle disuse in healthy adult subjects is sufficient to decrease muscle mass, tone and force and induce changes in function relating to uh, aerobic metabolism and muscle fiber denervation. In other words, being confined to a bed for a period of time is something that is very bad for you. And sitting around all day uh, by implication is also something that is very bad for you. Now, what I want to do is just focus on this issue of uh, sitting around. Um, we know the lifestyle factors that promote healthy brain function. Uh, these are among the most important. Movement, education, mental stimulation, uh, a healthy diet, being socially engaged and sleeping regularly. And what I want to do is just focus on the issue of movement for a moment. Uh, this very important paper uh, published in The Lancet a couple of years ago focuses on the issue of dementia prevention. And it concluded that about 40% of cases of dementia could be prevented uh, by changes in our behaviour. Some of them are not obvious. Early detection of hearing loss uh, accounts for about 9% of, of uh, modifiable risk factors in dementia. So uh, ensuring that people uh, do not become deaf as the result of occupational exposure is, is very important. At the core, when you summarize this life course model, uh, is the issue of exercise. Exercise sits at a nexus between uh, reducing depression, reducing brain inflammation, uh, keeping uh, hypertension under control or keeping it down, reducing uh, type 2 diabetes. It has marked effects uh, on uh, weight gain and also uh, it helps reduce uh, other types of brain damage uh, and acts as an adjuvant uh, to the immune system. In other words, it, it helps boost immune system functioning. So if we want to not alone have an effect on depression uh, uh, in terms of, of increased physical activity, if we also want to have an effect on dementia proofing our society, we need to re-envision and recreate our societies in such a way that it facilitates uh, movement under our own steam in regular doses right throughout the day, most uh, days of the week. And walking is probably the simplest uh, form of exercise that's accessible to most of us uh, during the course of the everyday. Uh, we should spend less time seated and we should spend more time upright, challenging our brain, challenging our body uh, by getting out there and walking in the real world. Um, I'd like to stop uh, at this point just to, to mention that uh, I publish a newsletter at brainpizza.substack.com where I deal with lots of these issues and uh, my book uh, In Praise of Walking uh, was nominated by Amazon as one of the best books of 2020. Uh, thank you very much.